So if F, big F prime, sorry, big F prime of X equals little f of X, and that by convention is what you would probably naturally assume, equals the natural log of 1 plus cosine squared. So big F prime is a rate equation for big F. It tells us how fast we accumulate big F Y values. If big F of 1 equals 3, find big F of 5. So this problem is basically an application of the integral. And even though there's no units or there's no context in terms of uh, accumulating, you know, real-life quantities, we are accumulating big F values. So notice that we're starting with a big F value of 3. That's our initial condition, even though it's not associated with 0. So this is our starting value, uh, and, and we're starting at x equals 1 with a big F value of 3. This is the rate equation, little f, of how fast we're accumulating them. And we want to know then what we accumulated from the starting position, which is at x equals 1, to x equals 5. Now, without a calculator, what you might do is find the antiderivative of this, right, using the indefinite integral, put plus c, and then use your initial condition to find the value of c. And now that you have your function, then you can plug in a 5. The only problem is that that method requires the antiderivative of the natural log of this, which, guess what, we're not going to be able to find. So for a problem like this, the only way to do it is do it numerically. So let's go ahead and write it out before we go to the calculator. What do we have at any given moment? And in this case, we're talking about what y values we have. So big F of 5, the big function F value at 5 is the big F function we started with, big F of 1, plus the net accumulation from where we started, which is at 1, to where we're trying to get 5, of the rate equation for big F, which is big F prime of X, dx. And that right there is the entire essence of the section that we're on right now. The integral gives you the net accumulation. If you add it to your starting value, then you have the value at that moment. So of course now we can make it a little bit more specific if you'd like. You could say F of 5 equals F of 1, which is really 3, plus the integral from 1 to 5, of the natural log of 1 plus cosine squared of x dx. And now you have something that you could type into your calculator on the home screen. So here we go. Um, and this is the advantage of doing it straight from the home screen. You got 3 plus math number 9. Ooh, it's dropping down on the list. It was math. It was 8 the other day. What well, jumped ahead of it? Probably Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio. Yeah. Yeah, good for him. He's one for seven now, I think. The integral from one to five of the natural log of one plus cosine of x. Now, remember, cosine squared is the entire cosine function squared, which your calculator, once you close the parentheses for the angle and then square it, it acknowledges it as the entire cosine squared. I'm not a big fan of that, so if you want to put like an extra set of parentheses around the entire cosine, that's, that's a safe way to do it. And then with respect to x, and uh, we don't have to worry about intermediate rounding error. We got it set up. We have it all typed in correctly. You hit enter and you get 5.766. Is that what you all got? Because that would be an answer choice. Anyone did it with me and get a different answer? Let's just say yes. Uh-oh. Uh what, um, what is a possible error, even though it looks like it's typed incorrectly? What could be a possible error when you're using your calculator in this case? Mm-hmm. Whenever you hit the sine, cosine, or tangent button, whether you hit sine, cosine, tangent, or one over, or the second sine, cosine, tangent, you better make sure in this class you're in what mode? Radian. I didn't check that. I'm coming out of a physics class. I checked my mode. Oh, -ho! I wrecked myself. I should have checked myself. <clears throat> I was in the wrong mode. Now, let's see. If I come back up here and recall that, what difference could a little mode make? Oh, it makes a difference. So it's not 5.766. Whoa, that appeared out of nowhere. It's actually equal to 4.243 if you truncate. 
So make sure you check yourself. And uh, the morning of the AP exam, when you come in, I'll say it many times. Do you have a calculator? Does it have fresh batteries? Are you in radian mode? All kinds of other things. Yeah. Have a taco. Right. Or two. Do you have pencils? Good. Are they sharpened? Great. Sharp pencil, sharp mind. Dull pencil? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, let's jump back to 6.1 because it is, in fact, like one of my favorites. They're all my favorites, really. Okay. Uh, example four. This one is no calculator, so we don't need the calculator. See, a calculator wouldn't want to be a calculator, dude. Yeah, nice. Um, a part, 2008. 2008, actual AP exam question. A particle moves along the x-axis. Ooh, particle motion. One of my favorites. It's moving along the <laughs> x-axis. So just kind of take an inventory here. We've got a particle. It's moving left. It's moving right or right and left. If it's moving to the right, the velocity should be positive. Let me try my notation there. And if it's moving to the left, the velocity should be negative. This is me just kind of thinking. To the right is positive for velocity, to the left is negative. Okay, so its velocity from 0 to 6, inclusive, is given by a differentiable and therefore what type of function? Continuous function V whose graph is shown. Okay, so now we make sense of the graph. If that's a graph of velocity, the y values tell me uh, what the velocity is. The slopes of this graph tell me the accelerations, and the integral or the areas give me the distance traveled. And I can use it to find total distance traveled or displacement, the net distance traveled. Okay, cool. The velocity is 0 at 0, 3, and 5. So what appear to be x-intercepts are, in fact, x-intercepts. That's good to know. And the graph has horizontal tangents at 1 and 4. So what appear to be horizontal tangents are, in fact, horizontal tangents. The areas, positive areas, right? Areas can be negative. Of the regions bounded by the t-axis and the graph of v on the intervals from 0 to 3, 3 to 5, and 5 to 6 are 8, 3, and 2, respectively. So they gave them to you in order. 8, 3, and 2. So I'm going to write those in there and circle them. Those are the areas. Sweet. All right, I think I'm ready to answer some questions. I don't really need that diagram down there. That's just kind of what I'm thinking in my head. Parte, yes it is. From 0 to 6, find both the time and the position of the particle when it is farthest to the left. Justify your answer. Ooh, we have a superlative case there, right? Anytime you have a superlative case, it's really what? It's an optimization problem, right? Really, we're trying to maximize or minimize if it's farthest left. Minimize. In part A, we're trying to minimize its position, really. We're trying to minimize its position. Farthest left. If it was farthest right, we were looking for the maximum position. Well, we have a closed interval, right? And we have a continuous function. So can we use the EVT closed interval argument? By the EVT, if the function is continuous on a closed interval, then the function is guaranteed to have both a max and a min. And it can occur at one of two values of x, or in this case, t. What are they? Endpoints or critical values. Good. So um, we're trying to find the critical values of the position. So I want to know what the position is. Now, we don't have a name for the position function, okay? But here's a good name to give it. Let x of t equal the position function. And this is a really common thing to do. You're defining a position function. And because we're moving left and right, we're calling it x of t. If the particle had been moving up and down, we might define it to be y of t. This saves a lot on notation. So now here's what we need to do. By the EVT, I need to figure out, because we're looking on the entire interval from 0 to 6, I need to figure out what is the position at 0, what is the position at 6. That would be at the endpoints. And now I need to figure out what is the position at any critical values. So let's go ahead and find that. The critical values of the position function are going to be where it's derivative, right? Which is what? What's the derivative of position? The velocity equals zero or is undefined. Well, that's the graph. The graph is equal to zero 
it tells us at three places, right? At zero, which is already an endpoint. So it's in the it's in the candidate list already. And at three and at five. Okay? So I'm gonna say that equals at three and five. If you want to be thorough, I guess, you could say t equals zero. But notice I'm gonna put my critical values. So the teams are evenly matched, really. Zero place for both teams, full time quarterback. So we got x of three and x of five. This is playing the game. Remember ding 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 the game? And always uh, the game. All right, not the Super Bowl game. Good morning. Thank you, sir. Oh, Mr. Erickson. Checking out. Oops. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and find the position. Now we're looking for the net displacement or the actual position? Where it's at or just its net change? Where it's at. And as we saw in the warm-up, where something is at at any given moment is a function of two things, right? Where it started and it, its displacement over the interval. Do we have where it started? Does it tell us where it started? No, it doesn't actually tell us where it started. But here's the thing. If all of them are starting at the same place, shouldn't the displacement be enough to determine when it's furthest left? Oh, it does say that. Where is it? Oh, it's at negative 2. My bad. I don't even think I read that. Did I read that? I think I skipped reading that. All right, learn from my mistakes. Um, I think once I read the areas and I went and labeled them over here, I went down to part A. It does say at t equals 0, the particles at x equals 2. But if it didn't, if we looked at the net displacement on each of these, it should still be enough to determine when it's furthest left. Because if they're all starting at the same place, the one that has the most negative displacement should still put it farthest left. Now, we won't know exactly where it's at, but we would know where it's farthest left. But because it tells us that, we're going to go ahead and use that. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and write our integral expression for each of these. Uh, x of 0 is, we're starting at negative 2 plus the integral from what to what? Well, we were at negative 2 at 0, and we're going to 0. Okay, that makes sense. And we're doing the integral of v of t dt. What's the integral from 0 to 0? 0 plus negative 2 is negative 2. Okay, so that was actually given. So you wouldn't necessarily have to show the integral there because it was handed to you, but it's nice to verify it. We have our pattern down now. X of 6 is going to be negative 2, the integral from 0 to 6. This is going to be a lot of fun now. Negative 2 plus. The integral from 0 to 6, this is the net accumulation. So we're going to use the areas now to find the integral from left to right. So everything below is going to be assigned what type of value? Negative, and everything above is positive. So it should be negative 8 plus 3 minus 2. Plus negative 8 plus 3. Minus 2. And go ahead and show the values from your table in your calculations before you simplify them. So what does that end up being? Negative 9? Yeah, negative 9. And then continuing on, now we got team critical value. It's negative 2 plus the integral from 0 to 3. That's going to be negative 2 plus the integral from 0 to 3 alone. It's just minus 8. That puts you at negative 10. And then finally, at x of 5, you get negative 2 plus the integral from 0 to 3. V of t dt, oops, from 0 to 5, sorry. Negative 2 plus, and now it's going to be plus 8 minus 3, or negative 8 plus 3. So that's going to be at negative 7. So this is probably the easiest way to justify it. Um, I would say it's better to do it. You're also reinforcing. You wouldn't need to. If you showed like the negative 2 minus 8 plus 3 minus 2, that would be fine. If you're using those numbers from your chart, that would be enough to indicate your method. I'm writing the integrals right now to reinforce the idea because it's a very, it's the whole idea of 6.1. Okay, now by the EVT, one of these is going to be the absolute minimum and one is going to be the absolute max. So, we were asking for when it was farthest left, which would be the minimum position. So which one of those is the smallest? Negative 10. Now, answering the question, it said to find both the time and the position. So now we'll answer the question. So 
the particle is farthest or furthest? Farthest, furthest, farthest. It said farthest. Is farthest left at t equals, let's see, 3? Are there any units? Seconds, hours, years? Doesn't say, so you don't have to put units. Period. At this time? It is at x equals negative 10 on the number line. Perfect. On the AP test, would you have to work through all the possible solutions, or could you just see intuitively that it's uh, two equals three? Um, oh, great question. Uh, the free response, the question was, can we just intuitively look at it and tell that it's at t equals three, or would we have to show the work? The you would show the work for t equals three, but for all the other ones. Yes, you would need to show it. Yeah. Uh, because remember the uh, right. We're going to look at the we're going to look at the uh, scoring guideline. There is actually one value that you could have omitted and not considered. Guess which one? Zero. No zero. You would have to consider. Believe it or not, there's only one that they would allow you to. The candidate lists are going to be zero, three, and six. So if you did not consider five, you would not have lost the point. Why? because it's a local max. And for a continuous function, a local maximum cannot be an absolute minimum. For a continuous function, a local max cannot be an absolute min. So that would be the candidate x equals 5 that you could have omitted. But I would tell you as a method of practice, just because we're reviewing EVT and it's a closed interval argument, it's good to have all these numbers here. Now there's an added benefit to it. Maybe there's somewhere else down in the problem where you might need to know what the value is for x equals or x of 5, you already have it computed, so you can now import it from part A. So it's just being comprehensive, it's being thorough, it's making sure you're touching all the bases and not running straight from first to third. Okay. Which if you're trying for a triple, I don't think second base is that important. Yeah, right, yeah. So that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, but you would need to still justify zero because it's an endpoint, even though, well, we're going left there, right? Correct. I'm sorry. We're going left there, correct? <laughs> yeah, kind of confusing. All right. Anyway, uh, any other questions before we move to B? Did we justify it? Where's the justification? All of this is your work. It's, it is, as uh, Burquist said, it's identifying the candidate. So it would be computing the position at 0, 6, and 5. That would be your mathematical justification which is the easiest for the closed interval argument. Okay, part B. For how many values of t from 0 to 6 is the particle at negative 8? Explain your reasoning. Oh, see what I said? It's very helpful now to have the position at 5. Maybe you answer these actually from left to right instead of endpoints and critical values, but whatever. Let's tell the story of the function in chronological order. It starts at negative 2, and then it moves left and ends up at negative 10, right? Okay, now as it moves from x equals 0 to x equals 3, and again, these are not in order, but as I move from x equals 0 to x, equal, x of 3, I'm going from negative 2 to negative 10 through a continuum, right? And notice that it's going to be moving to the left the entire time. So I'm going to pass through negative 8 once, right, from negative 2 to negative 10. Now, from 3 to 5, from t equals 3 to 5, I'm going from negative 10 to negative 7, which means I'm moving to the right the entire time. So as I go from negative 10 to negative 7, I should be passing through negative 8 again for the second time. And now as I move from 5 to 6, I'm tra uh, traveling continuously, and I'm moving negative again continuously from negative 7 to negative 9, passing through negative 8 for the third and final time. So... Notice having x of 5 computed right here from part A, even though it wasn't required, is very helpful now for answering this. So how do we answer part B? Well, you can go straight with three times. And that should earn check. And now what? It says explain your reasoning. Since it was at negative 8 three times <laughs> on that interval. Yeah, no, did you? No, since. Now, this one you had to talk about, um, this would be the what VT? It's kind of the IVT, right? The IVT. You can invoke the IVT, and that kind of adds a little bit of credence to your argument. 
Now, if you do the IVT, you're going to have to set it up on three different intervals, right, which could be a little bit of explaining, right? On the interval from zero, t equals 0 to t equals 3, since um, x is a continuous function and it passes from negative 2 to negative 10, um, moving to the left continuously, it has to pass through negative 8 for the first time. Second paragraph, right? As x moves from t equals 3 to 5, um, it travels from negative 10 to negative 7 to the right, passing through negative 8 for the second time, and then third paragraph, so on and so forth. That's a lot of writing, and you could do that. You can even throw in by the IVT. But this problem, as long as you talked about movement, and monotonic movement was kind of a big thing here, you got credit. So here's what you could say. Three times since um, the particle passes, or how about goes from, goes from negative 2 to the next one would be at 3, which would be negative 10. Um, then from negative 10 to what? Negative 7. Then from negative 7 to negative t 9 continuously and this was the key word that some students a lot of students didn't put monotonically okay which basically means it was moving left the entire time right the entire time left the entire time that would be the justification so the words that uh, they were looking for were the words from and to, from and to. Some students just said because it was at negative 2 at t equals 0 and at negative 10 at t equals 3. That didn't cut it that year. They didn't just say where it was and then where it was. You had to talk about movement. That was the essence there, from, to, from, to. So this is a little bit shorter argument than using the IVT. But then you had to say the word monotonically, and a lot of students left that off. So kind of tricky. So it's a very intuitive idea, right? It's moving from left to right, right to left, left to right, one, two, three. Okay, good. But then how do you, how do you capture that argument in an airtight uh, sentence? Okay, uh, part C, on the interval from two to three, is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing? Give a reason for your answer. I love this question. Speed... When you're talking about speed increasing, you need to look at two things, don't you? What's that? You need to look at the velocity and the acceleration. Just remember, if they are working together, speed should be what? Increasing. And if they're working against each other, decreasing. So we're looking at on the interval from 2 to 3. So let's look at the graph on the interval from 2 to 3. That's going to be on this little interval right here. The velocity values are what? Positive or negative? Negative. And the slopes, which are the accelerations, are what? Positive. So I have signs that are opposite, right? So speed should be decreasing. So all we have to do is something to that effect and say that, A, B, C, D. Um, speed is decreasing on the interval from 0 to 3. Since um, on this interval, again referring back to the interval because it's not in France, it's on that interval, comma, V of T is less than zero and what? You could either say and increasing. That's kind of a nice way to say it because that, that kind of assumes that the slopes are positive. Or you could say and the slopes of V of T are positive. I would be careful just to say V prime. And you definitely don't just want to say A of T. You could have also said V prime of T is greater than zero. But don't just say A of T is greater than zero because why? You've never defined what A of T is. Now if you say V prime of T equals A of T is greater than zero, 
Now you define AFT and you can use it for the rest of the problem. So any one of those would work. And you get a check for that. If they're the same sign, the speed is increasing. If they're opposite sign, the speed is decreasing. But you must say what the signs are. They're either both positive, both negative, or one is positive, one is negative, and which is which. Now, an argument that actually worked this year that I didn't like, but they did accept, is that since on this interval, the graph of V of T is heading towards the T axis, which makes sense, right? Anytime the velocity is heading towards the T axis, your velocity is approaching zero and the speed should be increasing. And anytime your graph of V of T is heading away from the T axis in either direction, your speed should be increasing. So I would say that that's a good way to quickly eyeball the intervals where the speed is increasing, decreasing, but not necessarily the best way to justify it. You could also sketch the graph of the speed, which would be the absolute value of V of T, right? And that kind of gives you an idea that now you can just look at the slopes. But again, not the best way to justify it. The best way is to look at the velocity and the acceleration and look at the sign change. Okay. Um, oh, that was part C. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I was, yeah. This is the zoom effect, I apologize, with uh, not, not being able to see everything and having a horrible short-term memory. It's still part C, and it was from 2 to 3. Yeah, that, that careless mistake, which hopefully wouldn't happen when I still see the whole big picture, that would have cost me a point because that was not a true statement. Because uh, notice from 0 to 3, um, what's happening from 0 to 1? What's the speed doing? Increasing, right? It's moving away from the t-axis. Now, what if I had made a mistake and said from 1 to 3? Would that still be a true statement? Yes. Yeah, I was going on an interval that was a little bit larger than what they said. It wasn't wrong, so I probably wouldn't lose a point, but you don't want to do that. You want to stick with what they give you. Okay, now part D. During what time intervals, if any, is the acceleration of the particle negative? Okay, so part D. I'm just going to do it right here where I can see the graph. I don't want to get that tunnel vision. The acceleration is negative when the slopes of V of T are less than zero. Again, you want to relate it to what's given. If you want to then say that's where V prime of T is less than zero, that's okay. But you're going to be specifically looking at the slopes, so that's what you want to say. On what intervals are the slopes negative? Yeah, this occurs. This occurs on the interval from, now you could use uh, interval notation or inequality notation. I like interval notation, so I'm going to go ahead and say T epsilon 0 to 1 union what? 4 to 6 or 5 to 6? The slope's not negative from 4 to 5? It is, yeah, so from 4 to 6. And again, there's no units. Or you could say uh, 0 less than t less than 1 and 4 less than t less than 6. Either one. So that wasn't a bad question to answer. We've already thought about that. But I do want to m uh, mention again that notice that for the part B, having that x of 5 computed was really, really nice. Okay, let's look at the scoring guidelines there. 2008 question number four. How do you think you would have done? Well, well let's look at the scoring guidelines so you can see, first of all, where the points came from. Uh, once my RAM catches up. Come on, RAM. <laughs> all right, there we go. I do, I do. Uh-huh, 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 come on. Mm. Slowly but surely, not like that ornery pumpkin farmer. Remember him? MVT? Oh, that calculus cop. Hey, while we're waiting for this to load, maybe go ahead and read the next one.
because I did get to grade that one too. Uh, it was a cute little elephant problem. And it was from 2010, which was the epic year for our applications of integration. Boy, it's really having a hard time. Come on, I can see it right there. Just open up. Who knows? I read a funny uh, tweet this weekend about, you know, how the FBI is trying to get access to uh, the iPhone from the, uh, the, the shooter, um, and they won't let him do it. And uh, someone said uh, if, if they want to know how to get into the San Bernardino's iPhone, if Apple's not helping, they should, uh, they should ask you two how they did it without asking they got into people's iPhone without asking. There was something. Yeah, anyway, it, you had to be there. Um All right, let's look at the scoring guidelines first. Cuz those 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 already pulled up. Here was question 4. So basically going through it, um you got 3 points for the first one, which I didn't think was that bad. And notice you got 1 point for identifying 3 as a candidate, which if you just intuitively said the answer is 3 and you claim that that's the answer, then of course it's a candidate, right? Trump can't win the presidency if he's not the Republican nomination. So if you declare him the winner, he has to be a candidate. Number one, uh, or that's one point. Number two, you got an integral for, uh, or a point for including the integral from zero to six. Now, when you com compute the integral from zero to six, that's basically uh, analyzing the right endpoint, which you got a point for. So I was wrong. You didn't actually have to include the left endpoint here. If you if you excluded zero because you knew the function went left immediately from there, you didn't lose a point for not identifying that one either. But then one point for your conclusion. Therefore, the particle is farthest left at t equals three when its position is 10, negative 10. But notice that we don't probably want to do that because to answer part B, you got three more points. Now, you need to compute its position at 3, 5, and 6, which we already had from part A. So it made it nice and easy. And then here's that description of motion that I talked about. From, to, from, to, from, to. You could have just said, here it was, and then here it was, and here it was, and here it was. Um, and there it is, continuously and monotonically, or it was strictly moving to the left, strictly moving to the right, from here to from here. And then by the IVT, you wouldn't really need to say that. Okay, if you, as long as you said it was continuous, you're kind of using the IVT without stating it. But it's nice to throw the name in there, but you don't get bonus points. Uh, part C, answer with reason. The speed is decreasing from 2 to 3, since on this interval, V is less than 0 and increasing. Okay, good. And then the last part. Uh, we got two points, one for the answer. The acceleration is negative from 0 to 1 and 4 to 6. Since the justification, V of T is less than 0, or V of T is decreasing, or the slopes of V are negative, which is what we said, on these intervals, plus 1. So we got all nine. Way to go us. Now, what I was trying to do is see what the national uh, average was on this. So if I can get to... Uh, Exam resources, free response. Uh, they've kind of changed it around here a little bit. 2008 uh, scoring uh, statistics. It was question number what? Four, right? 
Apple Control, Alt, Delete. There we go. Question number four. There you go. The average student on this question in 2008 got 2.6 points out of nine with a standard deviation of two and a half. So roughly from like zero to five. 68% of the people who took the test roughly scored between zero points and five points. If they left it absolutely blank, it gets scored as a dash, which does not go into this data. But if they write anything on there that has anything to do with math, if they just draw a picture of a flower, it gets a dash. But if they write seven and then a flower, they're like, ooh, they were attempting the problem. They wrote down seven. Then it gets scored as a zero. So this does, in, does not include people who left it blank, which is a whole other category, right? So uh, why do I show you these numbers? To inspire you, confidence, right? Because when you're getting all nine, when 68% are getting fives, you're cruising, right? You're cruising. All right. Um, you're Ted cruising. I don't know. All right, any questions on that one? All right, let's jump right on to the next. This one is a calculator permitted question, so let's go ahead and pull the calculator up here. Uh, this was example 10, question two. This one was good. This one was about a baby elephant. It was very cute. A zoo, a zoo sponsored a one day contest to name a new baby elephant, not an old baby elephant, a new one. <laughs> zoo visitors deposited entries into a special box, ooh, into a special box. Between noon, which corresponds with t equals zero, got it, and 8 p.m., which is eight hours later, that's t equals eight, got it. The numbers of entries in the box, t hours after noon, is modeled by a differentiable and therefore continuous function e from noon to eight, from zero to eight. Values of e of t in hundreds of entries, oh, what are the units of e of t? Hundreds of entries. Boy, that threw some people off. At various times, t are shown in the table. Okay, so we don't have an equation. We don't have a graph. We're given the table of values. We got this. Clearly understand what it is you're given. You're given time and hours and not a rate equation. You're actually given e in hundreds of entries. So at noon, how many entries were in the box? Zero hundred, right? At 2 p.m., how many entries were in the box? 400. Then at 5 p.m., 1,300, 7, 2,100. And then at 8 p.m. when they closed it down, how many total entries? 2,300. So all that is doing is making sense of the data that has been given to you before you start, okay? Got it. Part A, using the data in the table, or use the data to approximate the rate in hundreds of entries per hour at which entries were being deposited at t equals six. So the computations that lead to your answer. We're trying to approximate the instantaneous rate of change of E at six, right? Did you see the word approximate? What kind of alert are we on? Squiggles. All right, here we go, part A. How do we show that we're finding the approximation for the instantaneous rate of change of E at six? Yeah, but what do we put first as notation? E prime of six squiggles, and then request the difference quotient. We have to approximate a tangent line using a secant line. And notice that 6 is not in the table, but it would fall between 5 and 7, which means there's only one way that we compute it, right? Change in y over change in x, not change in x over change in y. So 21 minus 13 all over what? 7 minus 5. What are the units on there? Hundreds of entries per what? Hour. That hundreds of entries can mess you up. Now, that's where you would stop, I would hope, right? You got your difference quotient. It's numeric. It's kind of a two for one. It indicates the method. You got your squiggles. You got your E prime of six, and you have the correct units. But if you're tempted and you go for it, you better do it right, yes? 21 minus 13. Eight? Four. Eight halves is four. So it's 400 entries per hour. Is that okay? 
Can you do that? You can. That's the correct number, 400 entries per hour. But it specifically told you to list your answer in units of what? Hundreds of entries per hour. But if you wrote it as 400 entries per hour, you do not lose any points. But I would not do that, okay? Because now you're going to start getting confused. So just work with hundreds of entries per hour. If you wanted to simplify for the bonus points that you don't get, 400 of entries per hour. Okay, so that's an approximation. Don't even do that, but okay, it's nice to know. Part B, using a trapezoidal sum, my favorite, with four subintervals given by the table toggle to approximate, squiggle alert, the value of this. Okay, that's kind of weird. I have the integral from 1 to 8, uh, from 0 to 8 of e of t dt. So right now, if I'm not sure what that 1 over 8 is doing in front, I just know it's a constant multiple. And it's going to go along for the ride. I've got to approximate the integral from 0 to 8 using the trapezoidal rule. So here we go. Part B. Uh, 1 over 8, the integral from 0 to 8, e of t dt, squiggles. Now, my 1 eighth is out front. He's the rider. Now, because I'm doing a trapezoidal approximation, what can always come out front for the trapezoidal? A 1 half. Now we better go to the data and see, or the data, whatever you want to call it, and see what the delta x is, because we're limited. We're going from 0 to 8, so we're using all the data points. From 0 to 2, it's what? The delta x. 2. From 2 to 5? 3. So it's not uniform. So from 5 to 7 is 2, and 7 to 8 is 1. How many delta x's did we compute? 4. How many intervals did they tell us to use? 4. That should always match up. Unless they say to do like a midpoint, then you're going to have to skip. So we cannot, we cannot factor out the delta x. So we go straight to the rule, which is the width 2 times the sum of the two y values on either side, which is 0 plus 4. And you write 0 plus 4 plus the width 3 times the sum of the two y values, 4 plus 13, plus the next width, which is 2 times the sum of the two y values, which is 13 plus 21, plus the delta x is 1, times the sum of the last two y values, 21 plus 23. Close the parentheses, close the bracket. Um, you don't have to put units there because I just asked you to approximate it. There is your two-for-one deal right there. And notice again, you are using all the y values on the interior twice. But because delta x is not uniform, they get associated one each with a different width. Okay, cool. Now, are we done with that part, part B? No. It says, now, using correct units to explain what that means in terms of the number of entries. So now we have to kind of figure out what the heck is that 1 over 8 doing in front, which hopefully you're prepared for now, right? What is it? It's the width of the interval, right? Whenever I, you have a number out front, that's the same as the integral from 0 to 8, e of t dt, Multiplying by an 8 is the same as dividing by 8, which is the same as 8 minus 0. So when do we get integral over width? It's the average value, and it's the average value of E of t. What is E of t measuring? Yeah, it says E of t is the um, number of entries in the box t hours afternoon. So let's go ahead and say this gives... This gives the average number of entries in the box, comma, in hundreds of entries, always with units, in hundreds of entries, comma, uh, from t equals zero hours to t equals 8 hours, period. Always include units on your independent and dependent variable in your description, okay? Average the numbers of entries in the box in hundreds of entries from t equals 0. This week the library is closed during all three lunches through Thursday. So beginning today through Thursday, the library will be closed during lunches. Also, students, if you're interested in joining the yearbook staff for next year, please stop by room 115 and pick up an application from Mrs. Wimmer. The applications are due this Friday, March the 4th. 
Also, if you have a twin and would like to be featured in the Unicorn Yearbook, please contact Mrs. Wimmer in room 115. And there will be a student council meeting today after school in the comments area at 415. Teachers, at this time, if you could please share your DVD to Channel 4 for the morning announcements. You can also view them on your iPads at ndhstv.com. Okay, great. Reading on now, it says Part C. At 8 p.m., that's once the box was closed, and they collected uh, how many entries at the end, did we say? 2,300, right? So at 8 p.m., they closed the box. They have 2,300 entries in there. Part C says at 8 p.m. now, volunteers began to process those entries. Um, at P of T equals, they process the rate modeled by P of T. So they're giving us this cubic polynomial that is a rate equation now. It's hundreds of entries per hour. So immediately think about if you integrated something that was hundreds of entries per hour against hours, the hours would divide out and you have hundreds of entries. So, all right, from 8 to 12. So they started at 8 p.m. They processed until midnight, right? According to the model, how many entries had not yet been processed by midnight? Well, how are we going to figure that out? We're going to write a little equation. Uh, the number of entries, always get in the habit of labeling your integral expressions, not processed is going to equal what? Well, how are we going to figure out? What was the total number that they had to process? 2,300. Now, do you want to write 2,300 or 23? 23. This is where some students got confused. They put 2,300 down there. The, the, unit, the, the P of T equation they gave you is also in the same units as E, which is in hundreds of entries per hour. So you just need the 23. And then minus, right, if we subtract now how many entries they processed, that should tell us how many that were left, right? What we started with minus what was processed, how many are left. And the, the way we're going to figure out how many they process would be the integral from 8 to 12. The function's name is P of T, so let's use it, dt. And that's all you'd have to show for your setup. And now you would go to the equation. I typed P of T in during the announcements into Y1. So there it is. You double-check, triple-check, make sure it's in there correctly. It is. And now from the home screen, you type in 23 minus math number 9. 8 to 12, and then alpha trace. Oh, I'm not in the box. Okay, thank you. I'm not in the – oh, yeah. Good, good call. Good catch. Think inside the box sometimes. DX. Yeah, so before you hit enter, just make sure it's typed in correctly. Um, and there you go. Seven. Whoa. This is a nice number. So seven, what are the units? Hundreds of entries. Oh. Not just seven, but 700. That's quite a few still. We might have to come back tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, do we have to do anything else on that part? Nope, that's it. Part D, according to the model from Part C, I remember that, at what time were the entries being processed most quickly? The entries are going to be processed most quickly when what? When were they being processed most quickly? How are we going to figure that out? Let's see. If if um, if P of T is the rate at which they're being processed, and I want to know where P of T, where they're processing the most quickly, I want to know where P of T is a what? A max. I want to know where P of T is a maximum on the interval from 8 to 12. Here we go. This is another EVT. I'm trying to maximize P of T. On a closed interval, P of T is a cubic polynomial. It's continuous where? Everywhere. Absolute maximums occur at critical values or endpoints. So here's what I need to do. I need to figure out what is P of 8. I need to figure out what is P of 12. And then I need to figure out what P of critical values are. Now let's go ahead and figure out P of 8 and P of 12 because I already have that in Y1. So alpha trace from the home screen. 
I do that of 8. This will tell me how fast they're being processed. Zero hundreds of entries per hour. Huh. Does that make sense? All right, welcome volunteers. It's 8 p.m. Everyone find your seat. Uh, did everyone find their seat okay? How fast are they being processed right there at 8 o'clock as they're walking in? They're not. They're still finding their seat. Okay. P of 12 at midnight. What's happening at midnight? Well, let's just go ahead and do alpha trace number 12. Oops, got to put parentheses to open it. Yeah, y'all don't have a mouse on y'all's, right? You haven't bought that attachment. 800 entries per hour. Now I need to find the what? Critical values. We find critical values where the derivative P prime equals zero. Do you need to find the derivative equation by hand? It's a polynomial, so you can do it. It wouldn't take much effort. It would be 3T squared minus 60T plus 298. If you weren't sure if it was an ugly problem, could you let your calculator sketch the derivative for you? Yes. Leave P, P in Y1 and then come down here to Y2 and hit math number 8. It's coming up in the ranks again, guys. The derivative with respect to X of your function in Y1. Ah! Now I'm outside the box again in the wrong box. And remember, how do we get it to graph it for all x? We put an x in there. Now in this case, um, you could do this, no big deal. We want to find critical values. So set your window now from 8 to 12. And because we're looking for critical values, I like negative 3 to 3. And I turn my x scale to 0. Something small and symmetrical. It's going to take a little while. Now, this is going to be a local max or min of P prime, or P. This is its derivative. It's changing from positive to negative. So this should be where P is at a local max. This should be where P is at a local min. It's a continuous function. We want to know where it's a maximum. As I said earlier, do we really need to consider this one? For a continuous function, an absolute maximum is not going to occur to local min. So that's really the only one that you really need to find but in the uh, event of time, and if you want to be thorough, find them both. Now, because we're finding the x-intercept, what I would recommend also, and I'm feeling the crunch of the clock here, graph zero somewhere all the time so that it's ready to go, so you can find points of intersection, which is a little bit faster. Second trace, number five. Enter, enter. We're only going to have time to find this first one here. Oh, spinning beach ball. The original function, um, you're going to get credit for finding the critical value. So I, I wish we could look at the score lines because I forgot. I think you needed the derivative um, notation there. It's 9.18. So I'm going to go to the home screen now. If I hit X equals, there it is. If I store that as alpha A, I'm going to write that on my paper, P of... Uh, 9.183, which equals P of A. And now from the home screen, you can go just like we did before, alpha trace. I still have my function in Y1, and I can evaluate it at alpha A. And we get 5.088. Okay, and so your final conclusion, which we're running out of time, therefore, entries are being processed most quickly at T equals 12 at midnight. At this time, they are being processed at 800 entries per hour. Now, if I had time, I would go ahead and find the other critical value, but it's going to be the local minimum value because it crossed from negative to positive, and then you have your EVT justification. Okay, but that would be the final answer. 8 is greater than 0, which is greater than 5. Okay, uh, we'll keep working on 6.1 tomorrow, and then we'll talk about what Wednesday's test will entail. Have a great day.